Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Pellrein, the Director of Enrollment Management at CHCH, and welcome to our first live webinar. Um, given current circumstances, uh, clearly we had to change our on-campus event, and we're really excited to present um, seven different topics, hope, hoping you can join all of us for those. But today we're gonna kick it off with um, academics at CHCH, and I have a great group of panelists joining me today. Um, just a couple things. So, you know, Zoom, many companies and schools are using this platform, and so it's, um, you know, acting up a little bit, and, you know, some, you know, things might not be perfect, but we're just gonna put a smile on our face and just go with it, and um, hopefully our, our webinar goes as best as it possibly can. Um, we understand many of us are at home working and have pets and children, and, you know, things might um, get a little, little crazy, but that's okay. We're just gonna we agreed to be ourselves this afternoon and just um, you know have fun with this webinar this afternoon. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna walk us all through the schedule for today. I'm just gonna share my screen with you all, so just give me one minute. Okay, panelists, can you give me the thumbs up if I did that correctly? <laughs> Um, so I'm going to um, give us an overview of what to expect over the next hour or so. Um, next, we're going to have an introduction by our head of school, Dr. Lance Conrad. And then we're going to be showing uh, a video of kind of the day in the life of um, a student here at CHCH and what the schedule on our planner looks like. And then I have our department chairs and then um, Kelly Walsh is our ninth and 10th grade program director and also uh, our friend, one of our French teachers. Um, so each of our academic um, faculty are gonna walk through for five minutes each. We're gonna try to stay on track as much as we can, just to give you an overview of the curriculum for each content area. Um, and as well as, um, you know, different options such as independent study and other exciting ways that we can continue to challenge our students if um, those areas of strength are, are either English, math, history, or science, um, or world language. I did ask our arts department chair not to join us today um, because on April 6th, we'll be having our um, session for visual and performing arts. And then um, for our skills and academic support program, that's also gonna be, um, another session as well. I'm just sharing my screen of our website here. Um, you know, so that's going to also be taking place on um, April 1st. All right, so today's topics really is about CH CHCH's approach to academics. Of course, there might be some questions coming up about support, but I'd really like to challenge our families when the Q&A happens, um, just to really make sure your questions are geared towards the academics, and then anything else related to other topics such as student experience. Um, we'll have a student panel on Monday, for example. Again, the Skills and Academic Support Program will have a separate session, as well as the Arts and Athletics um, in College Counseling on, on campus, okay? So I just wanted to, to make note. We didn't wanna overload you with too, un, too much information in one session, so we just wanted to split these out for you. And then we have a really cool video that we um, did a Rewrite Your Story seminar um, last spring that some of you may, may or may not have seen, but um, just to kind of hear from a student and um, her, about her experience here at CHCH. Um, and then we're gonna, um, go into Q&A. And so for those of you not familiar with Zoom, if you, um, stop the share here. So if you go to um, the bottom bar on your screen, you'll see a button um, with a chat. And so in there, you're able to um, submit any questions that you have to me. And as people are talking, feel free to submit those questions and I'll, I'll collect um, common themes and throw those questions out to our panelists. Okay, and at the end of this, we are recording this webinar, so I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. And we will be sending the recorded webinar to all the participants and those two that are not able to be with us um, this afternoon, as well as all the contact information of the panelists, so that way if there are questions we're not able to get to, um, we'll make sure that there is a way to follow up with, with our wonderful faculty joining us today, okay? Um, so with that said, I'm gonna turn things over to Lance. Yeah, hi, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is uh, certainly not what we'd envisioned for our revisit today, but this will be the first of seven, as Lisa mentioned, um, opportunities to reconnect with us and speak directly with some of our community members. So we're excited that you're with us today. Um, 
you know, I also want to, uh, you know, take a moment to say that, you know, I'm, I'm broadcasting, if you will, from my home office um, off campus right now. So uh, we've been working really hard this week to get ready for distance learning that'll start next week. And perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Um, but right now, we really want to focus on, on uh, the current academic program at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall School. Um, so for me, just to kind of put things into perspective, um, we often think about <clears throat> some core values of the school. So we think about um, the C, the O, the R, and the E, the C being curriculum first and foremost. We're gonna talk about that in today's webinar. Um, but we also think about opportunities for our students and that we um, create many leadership and, and learning opportunities for our students um, throughout the academic year and in multiple ways. That's not just in academics, but also in co-curricular activities, whether that's sports or the visual and performing arts, um, community service as well. And then relationships, the R is for relationships. And we really are a school based on relationships and the quality um, of the human experience between teachers and students and yes, parents as well. And then finally, empathy. And I know that's an odd, an odd word to have as one of your core foundation elements of a school, but um, if we are nothing if not empathic, um, and it really is a characteristic that our students and our faculty hold dear to their hearts. So today we're gonna talk about the C for in our, in our core, uh, which is curriculum in the academic program. So I've been at the school for 14 years. This is my 11th year as head of school. Um, and when we arrived, <clears throat> my, my predecessor talked about the school as being an MI school, standing for multiple intelligences, but wasn't quite sure what, what that meant to the school and what we were doing with it. So we did spend a lot of time exploring um, this framework for human intelligence called the multiple intelligences. Um, and ultimately, when we started to think about how do we define intelligence? Oftentimes, people think of IQ as a single psychometric quotient that defines um, a particular individual's IQ. But the reality is that there are millions and millions of people in the world that have the same IQ as you do. So how do you differentiate from any of them? And that's impossible to answer, really. Uh, so for us, looking at a single psychometric quotient, like an IQ, is not a great way to determine intelligence. So we actually believe that there are an array of intelligences, and this was what Howard Gardner's research at Harvard explained um, beginning in 1983, that, that multiple intelligences you know, come in very various shapes and forms. So, so some of us are mathematical, logical, some of us are, are verbal, some of us are existential, some of us are kinesthetic learners, or musical, or spatial, or introverts, extroverts. These are all different types of intelligences that we have. Um, and our job as educators, with our students is to help them learn about their own learning. So it's a metacognitive journey. Um, it is important for teenagers to figure out what they're good at, what they're passionate about, what their aptitudes are, um, and then how do we as educators leverage those passions and aptitudes um, into teaching and learning. And that's really part of our secret sauce is, you know, we don't have a one size fits all. In fact, we look at each individual student's profile and figure out how do we differentiate learning for each of them so that it makes sense to them? So when we differentiate our lessons. Um, our teachers might differentiate the, the product that they're creating or the content that they're looking into or the process that they might go through um, in, a, in a lesson. Uh, perhaps it's the learning environment that they're, they're working in or even the type of assessment ultimately that defines student mastery of the work. Um, all these different approaches to differentiation are to allow students to feel empowered in their own learning, to, to have a say and a stake in the game. Um, and we firmly believe that if students help guide their own learning and are part of the path that they take towards mastery, that they're going to be much more engaged in that. It's a way for student success, not just here in high school, a college university and then beyond. You know, it, it's very simple. We are a college prep school. 100% of our, our teachers are going to apply, get in, and go to college each and every day. They all will matriculate, and there's a right school for everybody. Um, and just as you're figuring out what the right fit high school for you is, their passions and their attitudes and, and, and leveraging that. So uh, I'm happy to say that our senior class right now of 43, they all know exactly 
um, what schools they've gotten into. Everyone's got an acceptance letter sitting on their desk at home and they're making their decisions right now about where they're going to matriculate in the fall. Um, and that's our end game. That's our end game is to make sure that we are um, developing our our teenagers to make sure that they're ready for the next the next chapter. And then so it's all for me to tell you a little bit about differentiated learning, but how do we actually put that into play through the use of our daily schedule? And this is the, the, that really puts 75 minute classes into, into play. So with that, um, I'm going to ask. Uh, it was just getting a little glitchy. So I didn't want mean to say your time was up, but it was just getting a little glitchy. So okay. we just. Sure. No, I think we're ready to, to move on then. So I will stop talking. Um, I will turn things over to a video that's going to pop up and we will uh, move on. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. We have a rotating uh, cycle. Uh, we have six classes, and every day you have uh, four classes, except on Wednesdays and Fridays when you have three. I have three or four 75 minute long classes each day. For me, I start my schedule with A Block hey, publications. And A Block I have on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. B Block I have history. B block occurs Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. You really are able to delve deep into the materials that you're learning when you don't have to do too many of them in one day. So it's nice to be able to just like sit down and focus on like a class for a long period of time. Throughout the week, we have office hours where we can go to ask the teachers about any questions we may be having in class. We also have assembly throughout the week. On Tuesdays, we have advisory, where we go over our progress notes from the week before with our advisor. For teachers, I think we have a far easier time planning engaging lessons where we can attack a certain topic from multiple angles. My class is an English class where we can read, write, and talk every day about literature. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to turn things over to our department chairs, um, starting with our um, department chair head uh, for the English, uh, Mike Spencer, if you want to begin your session. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm Michael Spencer. I have been at CHCH for 11 years. This is my second year uh, as chair of the English department. Um, our big focus with the English department as you might guess, uh, involves uh, reading and writing skills, but also we're really focused on the progression of student expression, uh, both in their writing, writing analytically, writing creatively, but also in their ability to speak publicly and their ability to hold discussions and hold academic conversations. Um, <clears throat> over the course of the four years at CHCH, um, each grade level of English is really focused on fostering and developing those skills, starting in the ninth grade uh, with getting into uh, smaller analytical paragraphs and essays and students practicing their public speaking by sharing poems of self-introduction in an Odyssey-style feasting hall that we hold, uh, moving on through 10th grade, getting into formal academic conversations and performing monologues, uh, into 11th grade in which they start to discuss greater philosophical topics, start designing some of their own small educational units through discussion within their English classes to go along with their reading. Uh, and then by senior year, we get into the senior electives, uh, which is one thing I think that really makes us shine is the creativity of senior electives offered at CHCH, which are teacher designed, 
um, and are often on rotation based on interest uh, that of the teacher, teachers developing them, of what the students are looking at. Uh, currently, our senior courses include our AP course. We have a social justice and literature course that uses literature and class discussion and documentary to explore uh, modern social issues and also look at them in the framework of historical social issues and finding all the connections within those. Uh, we have a comics and culture course that is currently uh, working on a unit of examining Native American literature through graphic novels, which is a really interesting intersection of um, sort of cultural identity as topic and comics as format. We have a, a course in uh, literature and film uh, examining making adaptations from one to the other and how that works. Um, and uh, we're always looking at what's next with these courses. We're actually next year rolling out an experimental course in studies and genre that will spend each trimester examining uh, horror, examining science fiction, and examining comics, and then finding a different social um, or cultural touchstone for each of those, uh, looking at issues of uh, studying gender, studying culture, studying race through these different formats. Um, along with this work, we're always uh, trying to find opportunities for students to really shine in the humanities, especially uh, through our Certificate of Distinction program, uh, which this year uh, we have a junior who's just started his process on his Certificate of Distinction in which he's made his declaration of this is what he wants to do, and he wants to do work with poetry. And so he is started by uh, setting up a, an independent uh, focus of this with me and with uh, an advisor, uh, his junior English teacher. He's setting up some summer work and programs for himself. I believe he has plans to attend Breadloaf this summer as part of his prep. And then next year, uh, a big part of his senior focus for this certificate will be um, designing essentially uh, what might it be called uh, almost a high school thesis uh, practice work in poetry that may involve bringing in other students, considering how this can be a teaching tool that the student conducts, uh, how this can be something that impacts the campus community as well. Um, I really love that we as teachers in the English department are given as much creative freedom as we are. We're given a lot of like trust us to explore and try things and just really amazing stuff comes out as a result of that. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm gonna turn things over um, to Jenny Cook, Chair of our Science Department. Hi everyone, um, yeah, my name is Jenny Cook. Um, I've been at Chapel Hill for seven years now uh, and I'm the Chair of the Science Department. Um, our science department is really lab and activity and hands-on based. Um, and I, I think that my teachers, I know that my teachers spend a lot more time um, working with students so that they can think critically and think like scientists. Um, and so as part of that, about three years ago, we moved from a traditional science curriculum to an integrated science curriculum that allows us to really focus on that skill building. Um, so I'd like you to walk, I like to walk you through that progression quickly. So our ninth graders take physical science and engineering. Um, and in this course, we're really focused on those, those scientific skills. Um, so one of the major focuses is on collaboration. Um, so for example, uh, before our winter break, I sat down with a group of my freshmen um, and I taught them how to create norms for a conversation and how to run a lab meeting, um, which was very interesting with 14 year olds. Um, and then who are thinking about experimental design and iteration um, and that mistakes are okay. They're nothing to be ashamed about. They're just a normal part of science and learning. Our 10th and 11th graders take a two year biochemistry course, um, which is a, the topics that you would normally see in traditional biology and chemistry, but arranged more thematically. Um, so, for example, um, the spring trimester for the sophomore year, we look at global health, specifically malaria, um, and we're able to fit in some ecology, life cycles, drug design, things like that. Um, and this year we'll obviously be looking at COVID-19 as well. Um, the juniors uh, over the winter trimester spent a significant time on epigenetics and genetic engineering. Um, and they went to Novartis for a couple of days to use their labs and equipment. Um, to extend our classroom. 
And then for senior year, we have a few different options. We offer advanced classes in both chemistry and physics. We offer anatomy and physiology, um, astronomy, and our AP environmental studies course. Um, and then one other thing that is unique to the science department is that we do a science exposition this year, um, each spring. Um, and so it allows families to come on campus uh, and see some of the work that our, our students are doing in the classrooms. Um, so an example of that would be that the sophomore course does a stream ecology project. Um, we share our data with the Stroud Research Center um, and we're able to bring our data and samples to Science Expo and share with uh, our com greater community. Um, we also allow for a few independent studies, um, and this is really just at the, the creative discretion of the students. Um, so a, um, uh, the student that I'm working with who will be a senior next year, she's interested in nursing, so we're working to design her a pre-nursing independent study. We're looking at medical terminology through a local college um, for the fall trimester. And then we'll, we're still trying to figure out the spring, maybe medical Spanish, maybe more global health. Um, but ultimately, it's up to her and me to decide and make that um, a beneficial experience for her. All right. <clears throat> Great, Jenny. Anything else for now? Or? I think that's it. Okay, wonderful. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Ian. Hi everybody, how's it going? Um, I hope everyone is uh, having a good day. Um, I'm, my name is Ian McPhail, I'm the chair of the history department. It's my fifth year here at Chapel Hill. Um, and my second year is the, is the department chair. Um, just want to talk a little bit about our history curriculum. Um, you know, we are very focused on combining kind of content and skills. So, you know, the biggest kind of skills as, as Mike talked about when he talked about, you know, the English department, we, we focus on writing skills, we focus on presentation and thinking and critical thinking uh, and conversation skills. Uh, we, pro we focus on research ability. Um, you, we, we do that through kind of our four year, or our three year progression plus elective system. Um, you know, as freshmen, we, we study ancient civ. So um, we do it thematically right now, which is through a study of different kinds of human, um, uh, human, institutions, whether that's religion or government or, uh, ec or economic studies. And so we look at case studies of different groups that way. Uh, we move into the sophomore year where we do uh, what's called modern world, uh, kind of your classic um, modern world civilization. So kind of the Renaissance on, we study uh, the progression of human expansion across the globe. We study the issues of colonialism. Uh, we study the industrialization of, of the world and kind of where that, where that has taken us. Um, and then we move to uh, U.S. history in junior year before moving into an elective system. Um, our elective system is similarly uh, constructed to the English department. It's uh, based on teacher-created classes and created uh, based on student interest as well. Um, right now we have uh, a really great criminal justice course, which studies the, uh, the criminal justice system, its um, methods, the interactions between different people and, parts and portions of the criminal justice system um, and culminates with a mock trial in the spring where, where students will uh, take on the roles of different aspects of the criminal justice system going through a, a, a uh, made up case. Um, we also have psychology. Uh, it's a developmental psychology course where we study human uh, development from infancy up through uh, maturity uh, as well as abnormal psychology to end the year. We have uh, our AP U.S. government and politics course, and we also have uh, right now what's called uh, Warmongers and Peacemakers. It's a study of kind of the modern um, the modern world uh, in the sense of humans' impetus for war, why people make peace, how we try to make peace worldwide, and uh, you know the issues that arise from that conflict between the desire for peace and human history of war. Uh, it's a really fascinating level of courses. Um, we also do. Uh, certificates of distinction, as everybody else has kind of talked about. Uh, we have one student right now who's pursuing a, a history certificate of distinction. He's uh, applying to summer programs at universities in Germany right now, which is really exciting, um, and, and has uh, you know, taken some classes in colleges in America as well as Germany, and he's kind of pursuing that um, as his opening salvo for his certificate of distinction in, in history and humanities. Um, yeah. 
that's what I got. So thank you. All right, great. <clears throat> and uh, I've made a note of everyone's questions coming in through the chat. So um, great, great job participating, everyone. And um, keep those up and I'm making note of all those and we'll, we'll get through those in the Q&A. All right, next up is Mike Daniels who tends to uh, talk for a long time, but he promised me he'll, <laughs> he'll do a good job and, and keep it to the, to the number of minutes I have assigned him. All right, Mike, you're up. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, this is my seventh year of teaching at the Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall School. I live on campus with my wife and two kids. Um, and I thought I'd change it up a little bit um, and show you a presentation that kind of explains our approach to uh, teaching within the math curriculum. So I'm going to share my screen with you um, in a moment here. Hopefully this will pop up. All right. So hopefully you all can see this. Um, I think one of the unique aspects of the math department is we really challenge and support our students at the same time. Um, you know, some of our students come to us having had um, not the greatest experience um, in prior math classes. And that could have been for numerous reasons. It could have been based on relationship. It could have been based on um, just not having the right support mechanisms. And, and so when, the, when they come to us and someone says math, they kind of think of this mountain on the left-hand side of your screen. It's enormous. It doesn't look like anything they're able to climb. And so in that particular case, it's really our responsibility, um, you know, within our Algebra one and Geometry classes um, to provide those freshmen um, kind of a scaffolded approach um, that they can gain so that they can gain the tools um, that allow them to climb the mountain, uh, which is a picture on the right hand side. You can obviously see those folks are well equipped. They have the right tools and they have the support. Um, and then there are other students who come to us who are passionate about mathematics and, you know, they have advanced skills. And so for them, it's really about challenge and how we provide that challenge. Um, so I'm going to go to this. Um, I'm always asked this question, you know, what is the study of mathematics? And within high school, you know, kids tend to look at things as problems in math. And what we try and do is turn that on its head and really focus on the solutions. And what that does is that reorients the student to focus on the problem solving process and how we connect these students um, to real world applications so that it makes the learning experience relevant to them. Um, this, this slide right here is just kind of an outline of the basic problem solving process that we use in all of our classes. Um, sometimes it's explicitly used and sometimes it's not explicitly used because it, it's, um, it's just part of uh, what we do. Um, but it's fairly basic. Um, now with, you know, as the kids progress from Algebra 1 through uh, you know, all the way through AP Calc or Calc 2, or take some of our other electives, such as the advanced topics class, the engineering class, or statistics. Um, they're developing tools to add to their tool, tool belt, but fundamentally, the process is still the same. And we really want them to walk away with a transferable skill. And we feel that this is a transferable skill that is something that can go well beyond uh, the four walls of CHCH. Um, and I should have said this at the beginning, but the approach is just as powerful as the answer in mathematics. Um, this is an overview of just transitioning to curriculum in our offerings. Um, this is a road curriculum roadmap. So some, some students will come in at Algebra 1 um, and they'll take math straight through pre-calculus. Some students will stop at Algebra 2 and they'll say, you know what? I really don't want to take continue on the calculus route. I'd rather, uh, you know, my interest is in um, social sciences, or my interest is in the arts or business. And so maybe they they would take a statistics, a stats class, and then move into advanced topics. Um, if your focus is in STEM and that's your passion, um, we offer classes obviously through AP Calc, Calc two, and engineering. Um, I want to focus a little bit on two classes in particular. 
Um, one is the engineering class and the other is advanced topics. The engineering class is unique in the sense that we connect the students to our campus here at CHCH. So whether they're analyzing the bodies of water on campus using Bernoulli's equation, um, or whether we're building uh, bridges and analyzing bridges and competing in uh, the Boston Society of Civil Engineers uh, annual bridge building competition, or working with a local engineering firm, we're trying to connect the kids to real world applications. As it relates to advanced topics, that's a great class that combines uh, mathematics, humanities, um, you know, uh, uh, of the arts. Um, so for example, kids in, in that particular class might analyze a, a, a form of music. They may analyze a form of art through the lens of symmetry. Um, they may analyze a number system. Um, in years past, they've actually studied cryptography. So there are a lot of opportunities for students who have different areas of interest. Um, before I, I get off the hook, I did want to talk a little bit about the independent studies. Um, so the kids, we, our independent studies serve two purposes. One is for interest, um, and then the other is um, for those who are looking to accelerate beyond our current offerings. So we've been able to scale all the way up through multivariable calculus and calculus three. Um, and we've also been able to uh, help kids develop independent studies to, for, who are interested in pursuing business. Um, and so th that's kind of a unique aspect, I think, of the math department. And as far as the certificate of distinction, I think you've heard from the humanities, um, it, very similar in, in mathematics. We have students, we have, uh, Three, three students this year who are pursuing their certificate of distinction in mathematics and science. Um, I think that's a unique aspect of our curriculum because students can actually select where they want to dive deep and then we as educators provide them the opportunities, whether it's within the makerspace, um, you know, they design projects uh, in the makerspace or we provide them access to programs um, in the community or in their communities where they can uh, engage in collaborative um, uh, problem-solving activities uh, at local institutions such as uh, Worcester Polytech um, or Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, and that's all I have, Lisa. Let me unshare my screen here. Uh, let's Great. Good. Yep, perfect. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right. I'm going to turn things over to um, Kelly Walsh now. Sorry. Okay. Hello. I'm Kelly Walsh. Um, I'm the ninth and tenth grade program director. And as Lisa mentioned, I'm also here to represent world languages this afternoon. Um, I'm a former French teacher in the department and we are undergoing a leadership transition in the department. So I'm gonna to speak to the, the global situation here for world languages. We offer both French and Spanish in our world language department. And our graduation requirement is a two year progression of the same language. And we are very, as you've heard from other department chairs, we are very adaptable and flexible. So we meet students where they are. So if you're coming to us with experience in one of those languages, we will find the appropriate class for you and place you there regardless of your grade level. And if you've never taken a language before, and perhaps you're one of those students who somewhere along the way, someone decided that language is not gonna work for you, we say that's silly. Uh, language works for everyone and we welcome you into our level one classes. Our level one and level two classes um, use the TPRS method which is teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling and these are very engaging and interactive classes. They are not heavy on memorization of vocabulary or verb conjugations or the preciseness of diacritical marks. They are all about communication and proficiency. We're also starting to incorporate another teaching model, um, one that I would say we've always had, but now we have a name to put to it, and that's the CI method, which is comprehensible input. 
And that relies on students engaging and it's far more um, about, again, proficiency, not fluency. We're looking for communication and collaboration and just having fun with the language. Um, you've also heard mention that we're okay with mistakes and in language, we're okay with the messiness of language. And the way I like to describe that is, if you are a native English speaker and you run into someone on the street who is not a native English speaker and they are trying to get direction somewhere, they need help with something, you don't correct them on your grammar. Only language teachers would do that. You work with them and you work through the problem and you help them figure out what they need to do. And that's what we like to do in our, in our language classes. Um, we, again, if you have been told in the past that you have a language waiver, um, we do not accept language waivers. Um, we do work with families to find the best fit, but in my time here, I can think of any number of students who have come to me in a panic and said, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't take a language. And we've figured out the best class and the best time for that student to start their two-year progression, and we make it work. Um, you've also heard about the other end of the spectrum, which is those students who are very proficient and perhaps more advanced. We offer um, what I like to call the four plus model in our language program. So we have level one, two, and three. We start an honors track in level three, and then we have an advanced track for both languages and you can take that advanced class more than once and we have had some students take an advanced French or Spanish class for three three years and the teacher adapts and differentiates the curriculum each year for those students. Um, a certificate of distinction in humanities also applies to world languages and the certificate of distinction is a, along the lines of a major, if you will, um, for a student who is particularly proficient and engaged and intellectually curious and wants to do more than just the requirements. And we have had students in um, language do a certificate of distinction and do some summer immersion work and find a, a course load or a, a track for them with their classes that really helps them weave together different elements of the humanities in here and really focus on their their language skills. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for now, Lisa. And if other questions come up, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions on the languages. Um, if you um, wanted to learn a language besides the two that we offer, is that possible? Or if someone comes in um, as a sophomore, maybe took a different language freshman year, how would that work? And yeah. then someone also wanted to know if you could take both French and Spanish. <laughs> okay, so let me address the first question. Um, from my role as ninth and 10th grade program director, we do not recommend that a ninth or 10th grader take another language that we don't offer. However, if you wait until junior year and we've seen your progress and we see how you work as a student and we can identify a language program either locally through a college, we have a student who's taking Italian this year in her junior year. Um, we work with a family case by case and we we figure out something that works best for you but we like to get to know the students before we throw them out into the world on um, whether it's an online course or or a college level course um, but that there are certainly there's flexibility there um, in terms of taking french and spanish again that's very it's certainly possible um, it would be a case by case situation it would be hard to do as a ninth grader uh, potentially possible as a, as a 10th grader, certainly an option for 11th and 12th grade. Okay, great. And then just, um, it just came up, um, what language do we offer, French and Spanish? And then um, you could take a language every year, um, but in one of the other questions, do most freshmen take language or wait till sophomore year? So it really just depends on you and what you know you want your schedule to look like. Um, so Kelly as the ninth and 10th grade program director actually will meet, um, either virtually or in, per in person, depending on how the rest of the spring goes, um, to really look at your transcript and what you've taken and develop all of your um, courses and what you would select to take. Um, so I know that was another um, question is how, how do you choose your schedule on all the courses that have been mentioned? Um, so your first year here, we have Kelly, who's our ninth and 10th grade program director, and then Ben Riggs, who's not joining us today, but he's the 11th and 12th grade program director. And they will work with you one-on-one -on -one to develop your schedule for your first year. And then after that, you um, in the spring would meet with your advisor to choose your classes for the following year. But you would, you know, um, perhaps 
speak to the department chair if there's something that you're really interested in pursuing or want to go on the honors track or, or you want to, you know, you're interested in one of the AP courses, um, you know, it's a, certainly a conversation that that will be had as well. Kelly, you started to do this and maybe just finish. We, we jumped kind of into some terminology that's familiar here at CHCH that might not be as obvious um, to our audience. Would you mind just recapping again what a certificate of distinction program sure. is, as well as an independent study? Yes. So an independent study, you've heard us talk about the flexibility and the sort of adaptability of our program. Um, and so when a student, sometimes it could be a junior, um, most often independent studies are gonna happen in senior year. And that's for a student um, who has a particular interest that goes above and beyond what we might offer here on campus. And uh, we've, last year we had a student who was particularly interested in photojournalism and she had taken our photo one and photo two classes had done very well in her English classes and so she together with an English teacher created a photojournalism independent study we had another student interested in early childhood education um, she's a camp counselor a wonderful babysitter she took psychology and then went and worked um, in a her independent study block was working at a daycare nearby and applying what she was learning in psychology to that class so the, the possibilities for independent studies are really endless, um, but we do like to limit them to senior year when um, students are have a little bit more independence. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be very specific here and just read to you. So um, in keeping with our appreciation for students' individual talents and interests, and in an effort to challenge our students to engage deeply in their studies. CHCH encourages promising students to pursue certificates of distinctions in the arts, humanities, or math and science. These certificate programs allow students to individualize their programs of study and to gain breadth and depth of experience as they simultaneously prepare for college or university study. Okay, great. Thanks for from our handbook. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Um, so just to break this up a little bit, because we've been talking at you um, for the past 25 minutes and great information. Um, we got lots of great questions, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Matt just to play one more um, video before we jump into the Q&A, um, just to have a student perspective um, and voice as part of this. Before coming here, school was really stressful for me. I'm Mel, I'm from Dorchester, and I'm a sophomore. I was at a big high school, and I started to get really anxious about classes, um, starting with just a few classes, and then it sort of snowballed. And then I kind of, I hopped around for a few schools, because um, I thought, well, maybe it just had to do with that specific school but it really didn't, it just continued. I worked with a friend of my mom's coworker, and so she introduced us to Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall, and she said, you know, I think this is gonna be a really good fit for Mel. So I started sophomore year. Um, I was really nervous the first day. I didn't know anyone, but I did soccer in the fall, and I'm really glad that I did, because I made a bunch of friends who are now like, we've stuck being friends and we've created this friend group for this entire year and I am really glad that we're all together. If I were to go back and tell myself about all the things that I've accomplished this year, I, I don't think I would have believed it. I probably would have thought that it was a different Mel and that it was not me because I didn't think that I could do any of those things. I've gotten high honors for majority of the trimesters. Um, I was the lead in the winter musical and I played softball and we won the whole IGC championship. I've gone to dances, I went to prom, I've hung out with my friends and just the fact that I can say that out loud and I and like looking back on this year and I've gotten all of that from just like 180 days out of school which seems like nothing is pretty awesome. I took a I took a leap and I came here and I'm really glad that I did because I think it's genuinely the best fit for me um, and I'm just, I'm really happy here.
right. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Matt. Still get the chills when I see that, just having known Mel when she was interviewing and going through the process. So it's really amazing. Um, just having been here for 18 years, how many of these really great transformational stories that that we can share and you know it happens at different paces for everybody and you know it's a wonderful place to be able to continue to be challenged and, and support what you need it so um so we're going to get into our q a um part of this um i just want to make sure that the panel does the panel look funny at this point um i just see the cch logo over kelly's face can the panelists tell me if you see the same thing or not no, okay, so maybe it's just my view. Okay, um, all right, so I'm gonna um, jump in with um, a couple questions came up about um, technology in the classroom and the curriculum and how do we implement that. Um, so I'm just gonna throw that to one of our panelists, if who, whoever wants to tackle that one, Mike. Yeah, I, <clears throat> thanks um, for the question. That's a great question. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one. And, and this is something that I talk to my department about frequently. Um, we don't want technology to uh, interfere with the learning process, meaning we don't want to steepen the learning curve with, you know, by implementing technology. We want technology to enable the learning process. And so I'll give you an example of the technology that we implemented in the engineering class, the applied mathematics and engineering class. Um, the students were challenged to uh, build a bridge given certain uh, restrictions, uh, both size and material wise. And in the design phase, they were able to use a bridge simulator. The bridge simulator was uh, a tool that allowed them to tinker with uh, a variety of different bridge types, truss types, um, to see what their strengths and weaknesses were um, given certain dimensions. Um, and so that tool in and of itself kind of helped um, the students navigate and really understand uh, the complexities, but also the simplistic nature of certain trusses and their, their pros and cons. Okay, great. And um, Kelly, do you just want to mention the, the um, technology requirements for students? And as a follow-up, um, to this, we have a document from our director of technology um, that it, it explains all of this, but just to give a quick summary, Kelly, can you maybe touch on? Sure. So um, for ninth and 10th graders, we do require each student to have his or her own iPad and we integrate our use of that in the classroom. Um, we have a very robust um, online learning management system called that we endearingly call Mitch, my CHCH, where mm -hmm. teachers post assignments, there are discussions happening, there are ways to post uh, homework assignments for students to submit to teachers. Uh, we also use uh, quite a few of the Google technologies. We don't use Google Classroom because we have Mitch. And by 11th grade, um, we have we see some students continuing to use their iPads, others who shift away and start using a, a laptop. Um, but we don't like the laptop usage in the classroom uh, because we feel that the, the screens uh, break down the collaboration and hiding behind a screen, even a small classroom is possible. And so we the iPad is a requirement for ninth and 10th grade, and then students are choosing their devices as they move forward. Um, I also saw a question there about phones. Um, phones are, are, I would say right now, um, very much an advisor specific role, and the advisors help students learn, and SAS teachers help students how to learn how to use their phones, but most of the time phones are away during class. And would students be able to um, be able to type out most of their writing assignments? Yes. Okay. And then is the iPad, um, do you need an iPad in every class? Uh, for some component of a class, yes, um, including our art classes. Um, it's not used every minute of every class every day, uh, but all teachers are relying on the iPad technology at some point during a ninth, and ninth or 10th grade class. Okay, great. And, and speaking of, um, Oh, and iPads are not provided by the school. Um, we do ask that families do purchase the iPad. Um, for those families that are on um, a full amount of financial aid, then um, there is a program um, for those students that we, we would work with those families. Um, 
And um, let me see. And then speaking of um, Mitch, um, can you just explain kind of our, our weekly progress reports and advisory? That was one of the things in the video that you saw um, was incorporated into our class schedule, but I just wanna make sure that we touch upon that as well. So every week, um, teachers put together a short progress note for all of their students. And there is a parent portal to Mitch, um, just as there is a, a faculty and a student portal. And we publish the progress notes to students on Tuesday. And we have advisory on Tuesday. And you, as an advisor, you use that time to review progress notes, make plans, check on missing work. You know, is this biochem assignment really missing or did it just not get into Ms. Cook's hands? you know, before she wrote her progress note. Um, parents do not have access to those progress notes until Wednesday. And we do that deliberately to give the students an opportunity to make a plan to correct anything that they may, that might need correcting or to check in with teachers um, because they are high school students who need to have a little bit of independence and some ownership of their work and their work process. And we, um, twice each term, once midway through, and then of course at the end of each trimester, we have more thorough, comprehensive um, narratives from each teacher that also include a grade. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you. And then um, one of the questions, um, let me see, um, can you use voice to text app for writing? Yes, um, I, I don't, Mike or Ian might speak to this, uh, Mike Spencer or Ian might want to chime in here. Um, Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> with some students have what we find like it is very useful for them to get their ideas out in voice to text. Uh, we like to encourage technology as a means of removing roadblocks between student idea and student productivity and student like ability to achieve. So especially in the early stages of the writing process, if a student really finds a benefit from talking it out, having it be recorded, and then later being able to go back to edit, revise, um, put in that work as needed, um, I think we're very much in favor of using those tools just so they can get their ideas out, uh, whereas otherwise, if they would be unable to get everything expressed, then I think the voice to text is very useful. Okay, great. Um, Jenny, this was a question for you. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the physics and engineering class for ninth graders. Um, what does that pertain? Can you expand on that a little bit more? Absolutely. Um, so like I said, it's primarily skills based, but the content that we use to teach those skills is physics and engineering. Um, so the fall trimester has the mechanics um, theme. Um, we do thermodynamics um, with a little bit of chemistry through the winter, and then in the spring we do atomic structure, um, engineering, and magnetism. So it looks like a pretty traditional physics course on the surface, um, but most of what we're doing is diving into engineering design challenges, getting in the maker space, building mousetrap cars, right, and, and using those um, things that we have made to um, explore the, the more traditional physics concepts. Okay, and then there was also a question about computer science. If we offer computer um, We don't yeah. offer a computer science course, but that would certainly be a great thing for a student to explore as an independent study. Um, and I don't, Mike might answer this. I feel like we've had kids do that recently. Yeah, last, as a good example, last year we had students who were um, interested in coding. Um, this one particular student, had an independent study where they uh, took a coding class, and I wanna say it was like C++ um, at a local college here. Um, coupled with that, he also did some work in the makerspace um, where he programmed um, a software application that was, that was designed to help with teacher productivity in reporting. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the languages, I believe Python was, one of the languages um, that he learned. But the great part about our curriculum is it's, it's not Oh, Mike, you're frozen. Language, oh. you have that opportunity. Okay, great. And then one other question for Mike while you're on. Um, how is the math curriculum differentiated and do new students take a placement test? 
Um, we do not require our students to take placement tests. That's a domestic statement. International students, we do um, require a placement test if we're unsure about the classes that they have taken and the scope of those classes in the past. Um, how do we differentiate? What was the question about? Um, how do you differentiate the math curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> a lot of it comes down to, you know, student choice um, and student voice. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, so if you're, if you're taking a traditional algebra one class, you're going to learn linear functions. Um, I think what we do a really good job with is understanding our students' strengths and then also understanding where they need to be developed. So what we do is try and provide entry points based on our understanding of the students' strengths into uh, areas of the curriculum. So if it's linear functions and the student um, loves the stock market, um, we would provide that as an entry point into linear functions. Um, if the student was really active and enjoyed running, we might work with them to develop a mathematical model that shows um, how distance and time works. Um, so those are just two examples of uh, entry points into linear functions. Um, now, that said, they still need to develop the foundational knowledge to be able to work towards that. Um, and, and that sometimes requires remediation and a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, and the great part about our Algebra 1 class and our geometry classes are that they're small. Um, and that provides for a, a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship uh, within the 75-minute block of time. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to make note there was a bunch of questions about technology and requirements. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a document that our Director of Technology um, has created and um, we'll be sure to share that out. So it has all of, it has a Q&A section and all the information that you'll need for that. Um, and then also if you have additional questions about technology, um, please reply to me and I'll make sure that our director of technology is in touch with you. And then um, there were a, a lot of questions too about um, kind of the student experience and such. So on Monday, we're gonna be having a student panel. Um, so that's a great um, place for you to join us again. All of our live webinars will be at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so please um, make sure you bring those questions to that. Um, Mike, you did a great job explaining differentiated instruction in the math curriculum. And another question um, did come up beforehand, um, just to talk about differentiated instruction across all disciplines. Um, so maybe if we could, you know, talk about that within each each content area really, really briefly. Um, I think sure. I can answer that question. I can jump in uh, briefly for English. Uh, a couple of forms of differentiation we often find in the realms of reading and writing as fitting for English. Um, in terms of writing, that often takes the form of um, we try to provide lo a lot in the way of organizers and structures for writing. Um, and then the differentiation can start to come in with uh, the gradual removal of scaffolding at a pace that works for individual students. Um, students can often self-differentiate when planning writing. They might have the choice of, okay, I have to write this kind of essay. I have access to different um, worksheets and organizers that I could use, or I could develop my own plan for how I'm going to work through this and they can pick uh, the pacing the structure that works well for them or the teacher might say for this uh, I would like you to use this organizer because I think that's going to give you the structure that you'll find uh, the greatest benefit from um, another uh, bit of sort of self-direction self-differentiation that we are moving towards more and more in the English department with students is uh, bringing in more independent reading units with students in which um, students choose their own uh, books uh, to be reading in conjunction with the class texts and the class reading, um, sometimes based on a specific prescribed theme or concept, but the level and the focus and the format of the book is very much up to the student for something that they will get something out of, that they will enjoy, they'll really engage them as a reader. So with English, it's, we try to focus a lot on um, showing students lots of options and opportunities and let them determine what's the pacing 
and a structure that works for them. Okay, great. Ian, um, if you could answer, and also you had a question, um, how are diverse perspectives introduced in various history classes? So if you wanna talk about the differentiated instruction piece and then um, maybe go into that question so we can knock both those off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think in terms of differentiated instruction, uh, we talk about kind of building, we talk a lot in the history department about building a ramp, right? So we're, we're kind of working on ways to get, to make the content and the skills accessible. Um, and so that'll vary by level, but realistically, essentially we talk about uh, graphic organizers outlining, um, teaching students how to make, organize, and keep note systems and records um, in terms of, of projects and in terms of, of, of bigger pieces of work, we talk about kind of, you know, using the, using our office hour structure, which is something we, we can talk about a little bit more, um, to build kind of better systems to go from the ground up. But then there's also for, we talk about differentiating upwards as well. So if you have a student who's really um, shown exceptional ability in an area, whether that's presentation or, or writing or both, um, we talk about a situation where you're going to if we have a higher level so if i if your student is a is a sophomore and they've shown the ability to successfully and repeatedly write quality research papers at a level that is where we would expect sophomores to be towards the end of the year or even juniors to be in the fall we can push that upwards and say okay like we're gonna push you towards a more of a, a junior level writing um structure a junior level writing expectation essentially um not necessarily and definitely not in the way that like pushing you harder means you're going to do worse, but pushing you harder, meaning you get the opportunity to prove and shine in a better way. Um, and then in terms of the differing perspectives, uh, we're, we, we are very big on teaching from differing perspectives. Um, you know, I say that knowing that as a, a, a white guy, I have a very limited history perspective in some ways. Um, but we work on primary sources from, uh, different groups. We work on studying different themes through history. So, um, you know, it's not like we study European history. We study, uh, you know, try to find uh, examples of how people in different cultures lived, existed, and worked before colonialism and how people reacted to colonialism in our World Civ II class, for example. In our, in our U.S. history class, um, we just had a, a major project done on uh, put together by our, our primary junior history teacher on the, the Black American experience, and then talk about everything from, you know, early slavery through the civil rights movement, through uh, the issues faced with mass incarceration and, and um, you know, uh, issues with relations with po the with police in the in the in the Black community in America. Um, and, you know, students got to kind of explore a variety of different topics and, and areas in that. Um, so we do absolutely try to teach from a variety of perspectives and ex explore a variety of um, human experiences in the history curriculum. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian. And um, Jenny, did I already? I'm sorry, I can't remember if you already went. No, that's okay. Um, sure. So I think that one of the things that allows us to differentiate best is our 75-minute blocks. Um, so for example, in most of my classes, I'll spend a few minutes at the beginning doing some direct instruction or introducing a topic but the majority of the time is spent doing a lab or, act or an activity or something that's hands-on um, and so I have my expectations and I'm able to um, walk around and talk with each of my students individually um, I have a class that's five students this year I've had a class that's as big as 15 but not more than that um, so I'm really, that 75 minute block really gives me time to check in with each and every student and make sure that they're meeting my expectations or if it's a little too easy or they've already seen that topic before, um, I can explore something slightly different um, or slightly more challenging with them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. I know we've been on for a little bit over an hour, but we have a couple really great questions left that I wanna make sure that we cover. If that's okay with panelists, we're gonna go a little bit over time. All right. Um, so, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about, um, you know, some of the skills that we're developing for students as a, as a ninth grader, but what, what if, you know, because we do have some students coming in for 10th and 11th grade, um, how do we meet those students' needs and make sure that they're, they're being caught up? Um, 
you know, and another question was kind of, you know, if a student wasn't learning to their level at their prior school, what can we do to help catch them up? And, you know, that's a reason why a lot of our students are coming to our, our, our school from public school in particular. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a twofold question. So just, you know, how can we, you know, help meet students where they are as well as, um, you know, get, if they transfer in as a sophomore or junior, get them caught up. Who wants to tackle that one? I'll start. <laughs> um, so I think one of the ways I like to look at this is that we have a, a multi-layered, multi-faceted approach to setting up the right program for each student. And Lisa mentioned that I will reach out to new families um, over the summer. And while we, while you have already provided us a lot of information and we have teacher recommendations and we have report cards and we have applications, we recognize that those are done in December often and that that's only a part of who you are. And so we have a conversation in June, July, August, whatever it might be. And at that point, I know which teachers are teaching which classes. And as I get to get a sense of the, the student, um, again, we find the right program that's, that's going to fit. Now, it's important to know that um, for an incoming ninth grader, if you, have, um, if you are not ready to start algebra, um, we don't have a, place really to help you get to that point to be ready to start algebra. So we do need everyone ready to start algebra in ninth grade. But if you're someone who is more proficient in math, um, you might be starting, as you saw in Mike's chart, you might be starting in honors algebra two as a ninth grader. And that's fine. We, we work with you to find the best fit there. Um, and we are also very deliberate in 10th grade. We, we welcome as many as 15 to you know 20 new 10th graders in a given year and we're very deliberate with our orientation with the scheduling process with the advisor selection and we just make sure that we get to know the students as soon as we can as well as we can um, I'm a 10th grade advisor this year and I have a mix of students who are with us in ninth grade and those who joined us in 10th grade and that's another opportunity for our students to be peer leaders and to help these new 10th graders um, so again, multifaceted, multi-layered approach to making sure that we, we create the best program for each student. Great, I'm gonna ask Matt just to share his um, screen one more time with a copy of our planner um, because some questions um, came up um, about what does the schedule look like for ninth and 10th graders? Um, how do we have a balance between academics and extracurriculars? Where do those fall into place? Is advisory one-on-one? -on -one? Um, so, I'm wondering if, um, <clears throat> Kelly, you might be able to, to walk through that a little, br just briefly, just to kind of share a little bit more detail about, about what that looks like. So every student uh, is enrolled in six classes, and one of those six classes might be skills and academic support. For many of our ninth graders and 10th graders, it is. And, and that was determined when um, you all received your enrollment contracts, if we did mm -hmm. recommend you for skills and academic support. Um, you know, it would be part of your contract. Um, sorry, and at one point I do wanna just give a summary of what that is as um, kind of a lead into that separate um, live Q&A. That was another question. So Kelly, I'll let you finish and then we'll go into the SAS question. Okay, um, so uh, a ninth or a 10th grader is going to have a English class, a history class, a science class, a math class. Those are your four core classes and that you know, theoretically it could be your A, B, C, D classes. And then you might have an art class, um, either a visual or a performing arts class. And then you might have, if you're not taking skills and academic support, you could also add a language. And you'll see that as um, one of the pieces that's a little confusing here is lunch, but for a ninth grader and for many 10th graders, you never have more than one 75 minute class in a row. There's always a break after each 75 minute class. Um, ninth and 10th graders are early in the year are assigned to office hours to get into the habit of checking in with teachers. Even if you don't have something academic to work on, we like to have you spend some time with those teachers outside of class, but during a structured period. Um, and one of the other real benefits to our schedule is that you would never be responsible for four subjects worth of homework on a given night. So on Monday, you see your A, B, C, D classes and you might get homework in each of those classes, but it doesn't all have to be finished for the next day. Um, and that's you know, really a, an important part of, um, of how we structure things and scaffold things for, for students. Um, 
think that's enough of an overview right now. Hours, um, sorry, did you, I was looking at the questions coming in. Did you explain okay. office hours? Yes. We did. Okay, sorry. And then, um, and then after school, we do require um, the co-curricular program. Um, so please join us for that session. Um, so we're going to be ending with athletics at CHCH. It's going to be on Wednesday, April eighth at three thirty. We'll be sending you the the link and um, the schedule for all these upcoming um, talks, as well as the visual and performing arts. That will be taking place on Monday, April 6th. But you do have the option of doing either a sport or perform performing arts after school, and there are a few other options we'll discuss at that time. Um, but that's where students um, go out and, and have their activities after that. Um, so we do try to have a balance of that. Um, Kelly, can you just give a quick, quick summary of SAS as kind of a teaser um, for that next, uh, for the live webinar for Sure. Uh, so skills and academic support is our um, program that complements and our, our academic program. If a student is recommended to skills and academic support, again, it's reflected in your contract and there is an additional fee for the class, but we have very strict guidelines about SAS. So it's always a four to one ratio, one teacher and four students in a particular grade. And those classes meet just like any other class, three times a week for 75 minutes. They start with a lesson on a particular skill. Um, if, and the SAS teachers work very closely with the other grade level teachers. So we know that it's in SAS, we know it's almost time for the Odyssey Feasting Hall. And so there's going to be a lesson on public speaking or a lesson on following the graphic organizer to write your poem to be ready to present. And after that 20 or 25 minute lesson, then students um, follow independent paths to figure out what they need to get done in that time period. And maybe it's a little bit of homework or maybe it's um, getting some additional writing support or reviewing a lesson that happened in a class with their SAS teacher, um, either one-on-one -on -one or with, with the other students in the class. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then one other question earlier had to do with um, travel opportunities. Um, so something that's really cool and unique that we do here is um, something called spring sessions. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to do them this, this spring, but um, can you speak to that a little bit and opportunities for students to travel? Sure, so spring session typically replaces the last week of classes here on campus and opportunities range from staying on campus and perhaps building a guitar or building a mini golf course or um, playing in a, in a band and going as far as we had hopes for a, a hiking and photography trip um, in Banff um, in Canada. We had hopes this year for a trip to Washington DC. Uh, we've sent students to New Orleans. Uh, we've gone internationally during uh, spring session but usually only to Canada. Um, we had also hoped to run, we'd offered and we're, we were close to getting to Spain over spring break. Um, so teachers are always looking for ways to work with students um, out in the greater world and whether that's through spring session or through a field trip or a spring break trip. Um, we've got an incredibly dedicated and creative faculty who are always looking for ways to engage with students and, and bring the teaching and learning outside of the traditional classroom. Um, so like our independent studies, I would say that um, the possibilities are endless and spring session looks different every year and it's fantastic. Great, thank you. And one really, um, we talked about Makerspace really quick, that was mentioned a few times, but um, I'm sad that you all weren't able to see our new um, arts building. Um, we, we opened that uh, last month. It's a fantastic new space. And part of that is something called the Maker Network. Um, and, and all of the content areas will be able to use um, those various spaces throughout campus. Can someone just give a quick highlight of, about the Maker Network? Because um, I know a lot of our accepted students are super interested in, in that um, subject area. You want, you want me to do this? Hey. hey. Or Matt, do you want to do yeah, it? Yeah, I can, I can do this. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Matt, the Director of Marketing Communications here, and I also live in the dorms. Um, but I'm also involved in the, the Maker Network. So, um, yeah, so I would say make sure to attend the Visual Performing Arts um, session that we're going to have. The, what's the date of that one, Lisa? That one? Um, that one is on April, one second. Um, April, Monday, April 6th yes. at 3.30. Yes. So one of the things is we're going to get a look at um, all through the inside of video of touring the, the new Visual Performing Arts Center, which is amazing here on campus. 
Um, and one aspect of it that is, was existing before it, but is now being elevated is the Maker Network, which is a collection of spaces around campus. We have a, um, a maker space, we have a recording studio, digital arts lab, we have a 3D lab, Calsa Center, um, we have the wood shop. And so all, all of these are grouped together into what's the maker network here. And one of the things that makes it really unique to hear is that somebody asked a question before about can people step in and, and use the maker space whenever they want. Uh, yeah, we do have people who are there manning the maker space. We have somebody who is titled the maker space evangelist as their job. And they are there helping people work on projects. Um, but one of the things that makes it really unique is that it's open for classes to use to enhance the classroom. So when a language class wants to make a podcast, they use the recording studio. Um, when a mathematics class wants to use to 3D print something, they can go into the maker space. So it's really used to enhance all the different lessons to make things more engaging, more hands-on. So um, if anybody has any examples of things that have been done in the past, definitely jump in. But that's, that's sort of the, the quick maker network. All right, great. And then final question, I'm going to um, have Lance take this one. Um, you know, obviously we're experiencing some uncertain times here and, um, you know, I know a lot of public schools um, are approaching this differently than, than independent schools and here at CHCH, um, we have really fantastic faculty and staff that has been able to really come up with a, a fantastic plan. So I'm just going to have Lance speak to that briefly about how students are learning um, through this difficult time. Yeah, no, uh, I've got uh, 12 minutes until I'm hopping on a call with the entire board of trustees to discuss the very same thing. So um, I'll try to do it in 30 seconds. Uh, you know, this has been a trying time for us. And, and fortunately, um, when we had to pivot, it was on our spring break. So we had the opportunity um, to uh, begin to build the plane and the engines to the plane as we prepared to fly it. Um, and uh, what we did is we delayed spring break by one week. Uh, in order to give our faculty and staff the time to come back from break, refreshed, um, and to completely engage in this crazy wonderful week we've had of professional learning um, and development. And it's been a remarkable um, week for our teachers to rethink and reimagine how we might approach our curriculum um, in a completely remote learning way. Um, last night I did make the decision to continue with distance learning through the end of the school year. So that means until you know, beginning on Monday, March 30th until May 29th, um, we're going to be engaged in distance learning. And uh, in a few weeks, we'll know how it's going. And we'll know, you know, we will continue to shift and pivot and, and make sure that we're making the improvements that we need to. <clears throat> it may be fun to add a, an, eight, an eighth virtual um, revisit day session that is about where are we now with, with distance learning. Um, and, you know, the, the great silver lining of it is that it's going to allow us greater teaching and learning flexibility um, to shift paradigms as we need to. You know, there is some talk that maybe in the fall there might be a second wave of this. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping for on-campus learning because that's where we certainly do excel. We know we excel at that. Um, we're, it remains to be seen how great we can excel at distance learning, and we'll figure that out in the next few weeks, and uh, we'll be ready to pivot in the fall if we need to be. Wonderful, thank you, Lance. <clears throat> um, as we work together through through these next months, um, you know, if there's anything we can do at CHCH to help you navigate next steps and such, um, just a reminder that we'll be sending out this recording to all the participants. And if there were family members um, not able to join, we're going to be sending this out to everybody. Um, and it will also include contact information for all of our wonderful panelists. So that way, if you have um, specific questions for them, please feel free to email them directly. Um, as promised, I will also include the um, Q&A on technology at CHCH and what's required. If there's anything at all, um, there were lots of great questions. And um, again, some of them might pertain uh, to the other live Q&A. So, um, you know, we'll definitely have time to spend um, d diving deeper into those, those subject areas. Um, you know, so definitely join us. We'll include, again, a link for all of those. So make sure you sign up. And of don't stress if you can't make it, we'll also send live recordings of all of these. Um, so thank you for bearing with us through our very first live Q&A revisit day. I think overall there was a couple couple little glitches, but hopefully this you found this all to be helpful. Any feedback, other questions, I'm, I'm readily available and happy to help. So I really appreciate you all taking this time and apologies we went over, but um, really fantastic questions. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you on our next live Q&A on Monday, which is the student panel. Students are really excited to 
to chat with, with all of you as well. All right. Bye, everyone. Stay safe.